This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Now, when it comes to purpose, I have personally never been sold on the idea that purpose is solely about understanding your why or having a statement of why. A statement of why or articulating the reason we exist is simply words coming out of our mouth or onto a page where purpose for me feels much deeper than that. These words can certainly help us to access purpose and can be useful, but I think there is a much deeper truth. Purpose is not solely why we exist because purpose has a focus on all of who we are. It speaks and connects us directly to our inner self. With that in mind, what if searching for the truth of who we are was a much better starting place than why? What if we were brave enough to peel back the layers of socially constructed identity and of ego in order to discover a truer version of ourselves? If we did that, could it also be possible that we would discover our purpose there? And if all of that is true, then where do we begin that journey? Today's guest will answer all of those questions and more. Hugh Mackay is a social researcher, psychologist, and best-selling author of 19 books, including The Good Life, The Art of Belonging, Australia Reimagined, and his latest book, which we will be diving into today, The Inner Self, The Joy of Discovering Who We Really Are. The Inner Self is a book about the ways we hide from the truth about ourselves and the psychological freedom we enjoy when we finally face that most searching question of all, who am I really? Hugh explores our top 20 hiding places from addiction to materialism, nostalgia to victimhood. He explains how it is our fear of love's demands that drive us into hiding. And what I will say is with a 16-year career in social research, he is certainly qualified uh, to talk about all aspects of the inner self, not only from a, a social perspective and in looking at how we construct identity, but as a psychologist and actually an elected fellow of the Australian Psychological Society, he also has so many valuable insights and wisdom into how we engage with the parts of us that we don't necessarily show to the world, the more vulnerable and truthful parts of the inner self. He was also appointed an Officer of Order of Australia in 2015. And I can certainly say in having had the most wonderful conversation with him that that is an award that is so well deserved. So with all of the above in mind, let's get ready to dive into your truth within. Hold on tight. This episode will take you on a ride. Welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast. Such an honour to have you on the show today, Hugh Mackay. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's a great pleasure to be here and to meet you via the technology. <laughs> Good virtual meeting. Yes. Now, as a as a starting point in today's conversation, I am going to kick off with a question that I am asking all of my guests in the wake of what has been, shall we say, a turning point year for everybody. So, with that in mind. How has 2020 influenced your connection to a sense of purpose in your life? It has been very clarifying, Rebecca, and I think it probably has for millions of Australians and and people around the world Mm. uh, because it's a very unusual thing. I mean, generally speaking, we think of social isolation as being a bad thing, and of course it is a bad thing for members of a social species like humans. We need each other, we need communities, we need connections, etc. But a, a period, which we know is not going to go on forever, 
when we're somewhat isolated, either on our own or just within our own household for weeks or months at a stretch, um, it gives us a really unusual opportunity to ask ourselves quite searching questions like what really matters to me? I've, I've got time to reflect. Mm. You know, is, is this the kind of life I really want? Am I becoming the kind of person I want to be? The, all the sort of who am I questions. And I've been through that, uh, having no, no contact with other members of the extended family, no weekly choir practices, no coffee with friends, uh, no chatting to neighbours much, except when I go on a walk. Uh, so I've had a lot of introspection and uh, I've, I've come to some very clear conclusions about the need to go on writing uh, because that's something that I can do uh, in, a, in, in a complete isolation. I mean, what, what, one of the very fortunate things about being a writer is you can, you can go on forever, uh, whatever your situation is. And in many ways, um, being in a period like this of, of, uh, of sort of lockdown uh, is a bit like a gift from the gods. It's like so, someone saying, well, you've got, you've got a, a few months ahead of you where you can't do anything else, so you reckon you're a writer, well, you better write. <laughs> get, get, get on with it. And it's, you know, usually you have to try really hard to carve out uh, writing and thinking and reading time from, you know, lives that are, for many of us, just, just become absurdly busy. So I think this has been a huge blessing, and not a blessing for people who've lost their jobs, not a blessing for people who are struggling to pay a mortgage uh, or who've contracted the virus. But if you're not in any of those categories, uh, it's been a wonderful period of introspection and certainly has for me. Mm. Well, Hugh, I can certainly attest uh, to the fact that I, it's amazing that you have continued to write because I have not put your book down. So um, we get, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But before doing so, while we're on the subject of turning points, I actually themed season two of the De Decoding Purpose podcast around turning points. And the reason for that is because whether it be by choice or in many cases a crisis, these moments of no return seem to act as a catalyst for the emergence of purpose in our lives. Now, as I just said, having read your book, The Inner Self, The Joy of Discovering Who We Really Are, I know that you also notice the same pattern in regards to what makes us look within in order to connect with our inner selves. Now, in, in looking at that connection, do you think there is a direct link between the discovery of our life purpose and our ability to 100% know who we are from the inside out? I do, uh, absolutely. You've put it perfectly, Rebecca. <laughs> I, I don't think you can separate these two things because it seems to me, if we just take a step back and think about the outer self before we look at the... I mean, the outer self is like the shell of personal identity. It's all the stuff that makes Rebecca seem different from Hugh. And we can talk about that in relation to gender or ethnicity or age or the kind of people we choose as a partner, whether we have kids, the sort of job we do, our, our personal style, how we dress, how we talk, all of those things make up our personal identity, which is really all about us and our independence and carving out our own little spot on the planet that where we can say, I'm unique, this is me, I'm not like anyone else. And, and I, of course, it's very fashionable at the moment. Everyone's talking about their identity, personal identity, group identity, ethnic identity, identity politics, all that sort of stuff. But it's all about differences. Now, I think when we turn the focus inwards, and as you've said, it's often in response to a crisis or a trigger of some kind, not always negative, but certainly things like a pandemic or being retrenched or a life-threatening illness or a relationship breakdown, or a bereavement, those things can do it, but so can the birth of a baby or falling in love or starting a new job. There's all sorts of positive triggers as well. Sometimes it's a birthday. You know, sometimes people hit 40 and they experience the classic midlife crisis and think, gosh, you know, life is probably half over. Uh, am I who I want to be? So whatever the trigger is, we then start to look inwards and we discover something 
that I think is very surprising. It relates absolutely to the to the decoding of our purpose. We discover not when we go deeply inside ourselves. We discover not our uniqueness. What we discover is our common humanity. We discover that at the deepest level of our being, we are defined by belonging to each other. We are indivisibly. We're all part of a a kind of shimmering, <laughs> vibrating web of interconnectedness. Everyone we meet is part of us. You know, we're 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 all humans, and we're part of a larger ecosystem as well. And what that leads to, the, 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 the next important step in the process is once we've got that that's the most, I mean, the most interesting things about us are all our individual differences, but the most significant thing about us is this sense of our common humanity. And once we get that, then we realise, well, just as well, we humans are blessed with the one quality we need in order to preserve social cohesion, in order to help the species survive, in order to promote social harmony, and that quality is compassion. So this is a long way round to, to coming to the, the, the direct answer to your question, Rebecca, but in essence, what that says to me is, when we go deeply inside ourselves, our sense of purpose is fundamentally altered. We're no longer so concerned about making our mark we're no longer so concerned about defining our difference from everyone else and being unique. Now we can redefine our purpose in terms of what can we do to enhance uh, the, the humanity? What can we do to make the world a better place? What can we do? Uh, how can we change our way of being in the world so we become kinder? We become more compassionate. We have that capacity within us but I don't think we fully realise its significance until we've gone on that deep dive into the inner self and realised, yep, yep, that's that's the main thing to know about me, that I share my humanity with you. Mm. And, and Hugh, I know that the book itself is full of some incredible tips with regards to how we begin this process of, of tapping into the inner self. And some of the ideas you explored included everything from meditation to creativity as gateways to access the deeper parts of who we are. Uh, however, in the solar system of the self, as you so beautifully referenced it in the book, there always has been and always will be one unifying force, which is, I think, in some part what you're talking about now. And that unifying force could be considered evolutionary in that it's what binds humankind together or even spiritual. And that is the power of love. Now, this is, you know, undeniably such an expansive question and we could go on forever. But in your opinion, how and why is, is love the ultimate portal to the most intimate parts of who we are? Yeah, I think, I think, um, as I've got older and as I've thought more about this whole business of the inner self and the inner life, I think we are we're born to love. That, that's what that's what our our essence is that we are loving creatures. And and that, of course, love is one of those words, Rebecca. We, you know, I love chocolate. I love my dog. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love your dress. Um, when we say all those things, we know that we don't mean the same thing in every use of love. I mean, there's a big difference between romantic love and the love of friendship or familial love. But the love that binds us together, the love that really defines us as humans, is this compassionate love, uh, which, as you say, I, I use the metaphor in the book of our personal solar system with love, compassion, uh, being like the sun at the centre of our solar system. It warms us and energises us and enlightens us, literally. That's the moment of enlightenment, I think, when we get this. But the big breakthrough, I think, in understanding uh, the role of compassion and, and how we are born to love in, in that sense is to realise that this is different from the other kinds of love. This is not about emotion. It's not about affection. It's not about being kind and respectful towards people I like 
or people I agree with. It's about being kind and respectful to everyone I meet because they are part of me. They're mm. Because we're, they're entitled to this because they are humans as part of this vibrating web of humanity. So, you know, compassion is, is, is like a discipline, really. It's like a way of being. It's like saying, okay, now I get what my destiny is as a human. And as you say, you can think of this in evolutionary terms because we need, uh, as humans, we can't survive unless we can form families, neighbourhoods, communities, friendship circles, groups, communities of all kinds. We need to sustain us and nurture us and protect us and, and give us a sense of that all important feeling of emotional security and even the, the sense of belonging, the sense of being accepted. Uh, that all depends on being part of functioning communities of various kinds and communities can only survive or thrive, which means humanity itself can only survive or thrive if we have, have, have kind of looked in the mirror and said, OK, I am here to love. I am here. My contribution, my purpose is to be a loving person in this world, to be kind and respectful to everyone I meet. It's transformative. I mean, it's a magic moment because it does affect, it doesn't mean we abandon our outer shell. It doesn't mean that you stop presenting yourself to the world in the unique way that you do. But it means from that moment on, every encounter you have, uh, every decision you make about the kind of work you're going to do, or the way you're going to live in the street where you live and how you're going to interact with that is all affected now by this enlightened moment of realization that I'm here, I'm here to love. I mean, I, that, that's if I'm not doing that, if I'm falling short of a commitment to kindness and compassion, then I'm actually being less than human. When, when we see evil in the world, when we when we see tyrants and people acting violently and so on, we know that they have the capacity for compassion because they're human, because we all have that capacity, and we know that they have settled for less. They've hidden from the demands of love. And just to go back to that, that little metaphor you referred to of our personal solar system, here's the bright sun of compassion that makes sense of life. But of course, like the literal sun, it casts shadows where where we can hide. You know, we can we can we can hide from the demands of love in all sorts of hiding places, which we might talk about in a moment. But for example, in in our busyness or uh, in our materialism or in our smartphone addiction, we can distract ourselves from this central truth about ourselves that we are here uh, to serve the needs of the species for us to be compassionate. Mm. And you've hit the nail on the head because I definitely have some questions with regards to exploring the shadow self in, in a little more detail. But before moving on completely from uh, the theme of turning points, I'm really curious to, I guess, learn a little bit more about you personally. And I'm wondering if there was a turning moment that inspired you to write this particular book in this chapter of your life. Yeah, um, I've reflected on that myself, and uh, it's it's not. There was no trauma. Uh, there was no trigger. Although, um, I mean, there've been plenty of traumas in my life. There have been plenty of crises, um, personal and otherwise, but mostly personal. That um, divorces, um, you know, death of very close friends, um, too many. <laughs> Very close friends. These things all always stop, you know, bring you up short, and think, well, well, you know, what what really matters to me? What should I do with the rest of my life? Um, uh, I must say that turning eighty was a very big uh, turning point for me. It was a very big moment when I realised, well, that question about what do I want to do with the rest of my life has much more uh, sort of poignancy, much more relevance at this stage of my life. Uh, also, my wife became uh, very seriously ill, uh, and I thought you know, that was a that was a huge shock. Uh, she's doing very well now, 
Um, but that certainly was another thing that that forced me to look more deeply inwards. And it's and it's interesting. It was it was a bit of a turning point, Rebecca, because all my working life as a social psychologist and researcher, I've been looking at the externals. I mean, I've been looking very closely at people's the way people construct their social identity, their personal identity, the way people interact in society and so on. And I've deliberately sidestepped that 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 other side of the self, that, that deeper sense of self. So I suppose because that was my work, I suppose I tended to avoid it a bit myself, um, although I have often thought about it. But I think probably um, probably after my second divorce and the death of a particularly close friend. Uh, that was um, that was around about uh, when, I, when I was turning 60. Um, incidentally, I started the book with a little story about Emma Thompson, the British actor, who on the eve of her 60th birthday uh, suddenly came to this realisation that she was hiding behind a whole lot of masks uh, of her role as mother, wife, uh, daughter, actor, celebrity, etc. Uh, and she suddenly thought, wow, you know, I've been avoiding looking at the big central question, which is behind all that, underneath all that, who am I? So it is sometimes a late in life experience, but not always. I mean, I envy people who think deeply. I mean, you obviously think deeply about these things and you're much younger than I am. And I, I was talking on the radio shortly after the book was published. Uh, and there was a call uh, you know, on the Talkback Radio. There was a call from a young bloke of 18 who was just finishing his secondary schooling, and he was into these questions. And I thought, this is wonderful. I wish I'd thought as deeply as he was thinking when I was that age. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, like you, I, I definitely had certain turning points that, um, you know, I, I think for me really enabled me to, I guess, start to deconstruct the ego, uh, which was which was quite raw and vulnerable at the time. But it, it certainly is what led me to the pursuit of needing to understand purpose at a, at a much deeper level. So, um, you know, as much as that was probably a hard time in my life, it's certainly one I'm grateful for now because I get to have these conversations with people like you. So, <laughs> um, and but that, it is interesting. It is interesting, isn't it, when you look back, yeah. the times the times of turbulence and difficulty, even like this pandemic now for a lot of people, yeah. uh, they are terrible when you go through it. And there is a lot of pain involved in it, but almost inevitably, we humans look back on these periods of illness or relationship breakdown or heartache or, very, or, or you know, rethink or what you're describing as turning points. We almost always look back on them with gratitude and say, well, yeah, that was the making of me, really. People who lived through the Great Depression, uh, I talked to a lot of them through the years of my research program, and um, they almost always said it was a really terrible time, it was years and years of deprivation and hardship massive unemployment, much worse than we're experiencing now. Um, and and a lot of people doing it very tough. And it was the making of us because it clarified our values and, and our purpose, the very word you're using, mm. and, and helped us to reorder our priorities and decide what really matters to us. And those lessons, because they were such tough lessons, they, those lessons never left us. Mm. And, and that's actually a beautiful segue to my next question because, I mean, from my perspective, we, I, well, we're calling it a turning point, but in many ways I almost see these times as a bit more like a tornado. And, <laughs> yes. you know, you, you've obviously worked as a social researcher and I think in those tornadoes, everything that we identify with that exists outside of ourselves gets thrown up in the air and taken away and it's really only then that you're left with this inner self, like the, you know, the, the seed of all of who you are and, and what's possible for your potential. And, and that is why I think that they give birth to purpose, because as, as we've discussed today, it's, um, purpose is something that emerges from that, that inner self, from the truest parts of who we are. But, um, in coming back a little bit, what I'd love to have a chat about is if we are able to understand the difference between the socially constructed self versus the inner self, 
In your opinion, how do these identities play out within our day-to-day activities and decisions? How are we able to distinguish our true self from the representative that we send out into the world that we think we should be? Yes, that's a beautiful way of putting it, Rebecca. Uh, and it's and it's a key question here. Um, I think we we do become. There's a, a, a wonderful American psychiatrist called Robert Berezin, who I've quoted a couple of times uh, in in the Inner Self, um, who says that there is the, the sense of our authentic being uh, eventually sort of forces itself on us, and we realise that there is an authentic inner me, which has not necessarily been expressed in what you've just beautifully described as those representatives we send out into the world. I think there comes a point where we feel an actual discomfort. Uh, The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard refers to it as despair, the despair that we feel when we are living as if we are someone other than who we truly are. Uh, Carl Rogers, the American psychotherapist, who's one of my heroes, says similar things about the moment when we realise that underneath all our surface behaviour, there is a true, authentic inner self. Now, I think we experience that in various ways, but 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 as tension, sometimes we 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 feel a bit embarrassed about the fact that we're being a bit a bit. Uh, inauthentic, we're being a bit phony in the way we present ourselves, we're saying something we don't really believe or we're going along with a conversation that's actually uh, not compatible with our values and we should have spoken up and said what we thought. I think often at the end of a day people realise that if they ran a movie of their own behaviour through that day they would look at it and there'd be moments where they cringe and why would they cringe? Almost always, it's because the inner self uh, was not being fully expressed in the outer self. The the moment of the the real turning point, the moment of great enlightenment and insight uh, that we've been talking about, I think leads to uh, a new congruity between the inner and outer self. In other words, we don't necessarily change the way we talk. We can't change our gender or our ethnicity, etc. I don't mean that. But every encounter can be informed by this commitment we've made to being a kind, thoughtful, sensitive, compassionate, respectful person. Uh, and when and when that happens, when we begin to line up the inner and outer self more closely people notice that. I mean, that's going to be hugely beneficial to our relationships because we will seem to be a more authentic person. Many people say of, of someone they know, oh, I, just, I never felt I really got to know the real Bob. You know, I never felt I really got through to Bob. Um, or people sometimes say, even, even in a marriage or a, a long-term partnership, an intimate relationship, one partner will say, you know, I never really liked doing that or I don't know why we keep doing this because I don't enjoy it. And the other partner said, why didn't you tell me? You know, <laughs> why have we gone on for all these years? Um, uh, people people do sense the inauthenticity in us when our deeper purpose, that is our purpose as loving humans, uh, is not being uh, fully expressed in these in these representatives, uh, this social, socially constructed um, personal identity that we show to the world. Mm. And, and I find it interesting because in the book, you actually reference the notion that Eastern cultures have a, an acknowledgement of the inner self versus the outer self. And I know often in my work, uh, exploring the nature of purpose, I often reference a Japanese proverb that states that we have three faces, one which we share with the world, one we share with our intimate circle, and one that we only ever share with ourselves. And and for me, this has been a really beautiful way to explore how we engage with purpose. However, yes. 
it's interesting that in the West, we don't seem to have a narrative that directly acknowledges this inner self. So in your opinion, as a social researcher, why do you think that in Western cultures, we seem less willing to step into the vulnerabilities of acknowledging the true self? Mm. It's a very interesting point. And as you say, in the book, I, when I was uh, looking for examples from cultures around the world of people who do uh, make absolutely explicit the, the, these different faces that we have, uh, they aren't Western cultures. Um, Japanese, Chinese, Iranian, uh, there are lots of cultures that I've quoted uh, that make this quite explicit. And you, that, that three phases that you spoke about in the Japanese model is beautiful. Uh, example of it. Uh, so what, what is it about our Western culture? Um, there, are, there are a few things I'd say about us. We, uh, I mean, I think if we go back far enough, we probably would find uh, that that was a different story. But certainly since the 18th century, uh, Western culture has been heavily shaped by what was called the Enlightenment. But that was, uh, it was really uh, a move away, I think, from our sense of ourselves as people who belong, as people who are inextricably uh, uh, connected to herds and tribes, you know, villages, communities, extended families and so on, uh, a gradual shift towards a much more individualistic culture, uh, which in turn has made us a more competitive and materialistic culture. I think you'd say that the rise of individualism and the rise of materialism in Western culture, uh, both of those things are antithetical to what we might call spiritual reflection or uh, inward questing for a deeper sense of who we are and what our purpose is. I, I think probably I wouldn't make this as, a, as quite as important a point as the one I've just made, but I think the decline of religion in Western societies is probably relevant as well. I mean, there are many reasons why there's been a decline, uh, some of them to do with institutional corruption, and, and uh, they've deserved the decline. But um, when you look around the world, I mean, uh, about 75% of the world's population are aligned with one of the four major religions. Uh, in other words, most people on the planet use some kind of religious framework for guiding their introspection uh, and their spiritual reflection. Uh, and I think in a society like Australia, where, for example, regular in the Christian religion, regular church going is down to about seven or eight percent of the population who attend church weekly. It, it's more for monthly and more at Christmas and so on. And, and still 52 percent of Australians in the last census identified as Christian, but they don't seem to practice the Christian religion. But what that means is uh, that, that people who perhaps once went to church but now don't, uh, or families who stop going, but they've missed out on uh, the weekly exposure to an opportunity through music and sermons and so on uh, to reflect, even just for an hour a week, uh, to reflect more deeply on the nature of the soul, I suppose, which is another word for the inner self. So I think that's, that's also been uh, a big factor, um, but not as big, I think, although these things are all intertwined, but I think the we, we, we are identifi identifiably a materialistic and individualistic culture, and I think that's been very bad for our spiritual health. Mm. And, Hugh, um, you referenced, just in, in looping back a little bit, you, you referenced the research you'd done on the Great Depression. Um, and, you know, for someone of your generation, I imagine, you know, growing up, post-Great Depression, you probably really had to work within a culture of, you know, pull up your socks and just get on with it. Yes. And that, that sense of being tough. And I say that because my dad is um, from your generation, so I've observed this over his, his lifetime. Um, for you, and I guess this is a bit of a personal question, what was it like, I mean, I know you've continued to write, but going through retirement and, you know, getting off that kind of 
treadmill of being busy and working within this success paradigm and then coming off that, was it confronting to all of a sudden have to look at yourself and, and go into your identity? Um, look, I think I think the, the looking at myself really happened gradually and a bit before. And, and that whole process, interesting, Rebecca, that whole process for me has been very gradual. I mean, I, I, there certainly was a day when I did my last piece of a, a specific social research and wrote the report and that was it and I knew that was the last one. Mm. But I was already writing books and doing a lot of public speaking uh, about all these these themes, about particularly about social change and so on. So I never felt as though there was a treadmill that I got off. Uh, I felt as though I, I did move away from a kind of corporate structure to becoming a much more liberated individual mm. <laughs> with much more freedom to decide what I would do and when I would do it. But because I've been writing consistently since then, uh, I've always been occupied. I've always, you know, every day I've gone to my desk at nine o'clock and started work uh, on whatever I was writing. Um, so I think I was very fortunate in that way. I've seen some of my friends really struggle to kind of reshape their their social, their personal identity, mm. their mm. outer shell, uh, and in some cases that's led to unhappiness and frustration and, and terrible restlessness. In some cases, it has more productively sent them on a, a journey within to think more deeply about their, their purpose for what remains of their, of their life beyond their formal working life. And mostly those people have got involved in volunteer work or doing other things that are very explicitly designed to uh, promote social harmony and, you know, help the disadvantaged and all that sort of stuff. I think that's a very common late in life response. Um, but in my own case, certainly, as you said, I mean, my parents were uh, were young adults through the Great Depression and that did shape them. And that, absolutely, as you've described, they were a stiff upper lip, come on, straighten your shoulders, get on with it. Um, my mother uh, was very sceptical about any concept of mental illness, for example, depression, anxiety, those sort of things, until she herself, very late in life, towards the end of her life, uh, was plunged into the depression as a result of uh, an illness that she had. And then, of course, her whole attitude changed. <laughs> that experience made her far more sympathetic to other people who suffered mental illness as well. Mm, well, look, I'm sure your work with this book is, is going to help so many people who are suffering with mental illness because I think a, a big, you know, obviously there's there's the medical side of suffering from depression and anxiety, but in terms of the psychological side, so much of the work I think um, required to heal from mental health issues is actually about uh, allowing the inner self to have a voice so that we can explore yeah. all of these things that are hidden away, which is, you know, very much what your book is focused on. So I'm sure your your book itself is such a gift for so many people who are dealing with those issues. Oh, well, that, that's very kind of you to express it like that, Rebecca. Mm. That's certainly the purpose of the book. And, and I think it is it is um, ab absolutely true. I mean, as you say, there there are many there are many causes of anxiety and depression, and some people do need therapeutic help. Sometimes even uh, medication and so on to help them through particularly tough periods. But but the best antidote to anxiety and depression is uh, to be in touch with the inner self for the reasons that we've been exploring in this conversation. It's not just that I get to know myself better and isn't that terrific. It is that once I get to know myself better and understand that as a human, I'm here to be a loving, connected, uh, interacting, compassionate person, uh, compassion is the great antidote. I mean, as soon as we switch, I've heard so many people who've been suffering from anxiety, even people who've recently written books about their experience of living with anxiety, say, as soon as the focus shifts to the needs of someone else, we the anxiety kind of melts away. You know, we're focused on the fact that this person needs me 
uh, and that's and that becomes my focus. Uh, Gandhi uh, famously said, "The best way to find ourselves is to lose ourselves in the service of others," uh, and I think that's a very, a very powerful quote uh, because it does remind us that anxiety and depression uh, can be, particularly anxiety, can can lead to a very self-absorbed state where we're so anxious we're so concerned about the things that are making us anxious that we forget to pause look within and say hang on my my core quality is my capacity to exercise compassion i need to get out get on with it i need to be out there uh, responding to because there'll be in my own street there'll be people who need even if, if they just need a listening ear but they might need me to mow their lawn or do their shopping or something uh, as soon as we as soon as we tune in we discover all around us there are people who need us mm. so Hugh I, I now want to dive in to the shadow self which we which we referenced earlier uh, in the interview today. In the preface of the Inner Self book, you said these words, writing this book has been as challenging as reading it will be. I have had to face some deep questions about my own inadequacies. And when I read this line, not only did I think it was brave, but it also raised so many questions for me about our ability to own all of who we are, the light Mm. and the shadow. Now, Mm. Conceptually, this idea may seem easy, but in practice, this requires such a deep surrender of the ego. So I actually have two questions here. In your experience, how did accepting your inadequacies empower your connection with your true self? And, you know, what did that process look like for you? Mm. Yeah, it is a, it's part of the revelation about Um, understanding our true self and our core capacities as humans uh, and it's not pleasant Um, but to realize that I am not a bright shiny person who's all terrific and wise and wonderful but I am a mixture I'm a mixture of light and darkness I'm a mixture of noble motives and dark motives and they are part of who I am I'm a person who's capable because it's been true at various stages of my life. As I, as I said, when we were talking about the metaphorical thing of our personal solar system and compassion is like the bright sun that casts shadows, uh, some of those shadows are very welcome hiding places from the demands of love. Um, for example, busyness. I mean, there have been periods in my life when I've been very happy uh, to surrender myself to busyness as a way of avoiding dealing with some difficult relationship questions and that of course also meant a way of avoiding an encounter with my inner self um uh, I, I think the the secret here is there are two, two things i'd say about this rebecca one is when we recognize that we are all light and dark we also should recognize that the dark is only there because of the light in other words I know I'm speaking in metaphors, but I think this makes psychological sense. We only have the dark places where we sometimes hide from the demands of love because we are loving beings. In other words, we have to we have to be illuminated by the light of compassion. For, for example, pe- people say there's often a fine line between love and hate. Yes, love is capable of casting shocking shadows, including hate. Uh, when when people have a surge of hope or faith, that always casts a shadow of doubt. Uh, and we do have all these places. I mean, people have violent impulses. People are possessed by feelings of jealousy or envy or greed or hatred. Uh, and, and we need to face that because if we don't, fo- we need to face it, first of all, to recognize it's only there because of the love. These are shadows cast by the love. But also, if we don't confront them, they're going to fester. If we don't confront and deal with our anger and where it came from, it might erupt into violence um, uh, because we haven't 
looked at the whole picture. People who say, oh, look, I don't want to, I don't want to look in, inside myself. I'm not interested in the inner self. I think it's a pretty dark and murky place and I don't really want to know what's down there. Well, let me, let me encourage anyone who's saying that to say, get in there and have a look. It's only, of course there are dark places. They are only dark because something had to cast those shadows and that, that's the love that you've been hiding from. That's the capacity to be uh, a more compassionate, a kinder person. When you're hiding from that, sure, there are dark places, but confront them, recognize where they come from and learn to acknowledge that they will, they will always be there. Uh, but if we acknowledge that they're there and that they are part of us, first of all, that'll keep us appropriately humble, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> we, won't, we won't be too arrogant about how smart or clever or how kind we are because there'll be times for all of us when we'll stumble and fall short of that ideal. Mm. Uh, everything um, you're, you're saying now reminds me of one of my favourite quotes by, by Carl Jung that says, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. It's one yes. of my favourite lines. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's how true that is. He was a very wise man. He certainly was and did some some incredible work on on the shadow self. Mm. Hugh, as as much as this book is about the inner self, much of the focus is also on why and how we hide from ourselves. Mm. And I definitely want to traverse through a few of those ideas today. However, before doing so, I want to get inside the idea that we are the most reluctant to answer one question as, as you reference in the book. And the question is this, what will be required of me if I get to the core of who I am? In a conversation about purpose, I found this really interesting because while so many of us crave to have a life purpose, I think often what stops us is this same question. And Marianne Williamson summed this up beautifully when she said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Yes. Do you think human beings are fundamentally afraid of our highest potential, which is maybe one of the reasons we hide from our inner self? I do, absolutely. And I love that quote uh, and, and I agree with it. Um, and as you said, that, quoting the question that I raised in the book, what will be required of me uh, you know, if I get in touch with my inner self, uh, I think we have an intuitive sense that there is a nobility in human beings which we could rise to. There is, a, there is an ideal standard of behaviour. Uh, there is a capacity for being good, good guys. There's a capacity for being kind, thoughtful, sensitive, responsive, compassionate people that we all have, but we kind of hesitate because we think, well, if I'm, if I'm going to become fully that person, uh, will I be? Will will this be too hard? Will it, will it be too demanding if I'm going to try to be kind to the bloke next door who I really can't stand? And every time we talk about politics, he makes my blood boil. Answer: Yes, uh, that will be required of you. Uh, love's work is the hardest work of all. We know that in the context of romantic love, maintaining a loving, intimate relationship doesn't just happen. It's not a sort of happily ever after what a breezy prospect. It's something that does require a lot of constant hard work. And sometimes it's very painful and sometimes we feel like giving it all away and starting again. And sometimes we're prepared to sort of knuckle down and get on with it. It's not, not easy. And being a compassionate person in the world is not easy. Uh, so I, th I don't think it's at all amazing that there is this reluctance to take the final step and say, I could be like this. I could be a much more compassionate, uh, much more helpful, much more supportive member of my neighbourhood, my community than I have been. Uh, uh, have I got it in me? Have I got, have I got the courage? Have I got the strength? Now, I think one of the one of the points that has to be made in this context, Rebecca, is that no one is expecting anyone to be 100% fully engaged, compassionate, kind, loving all the time. All of us need time out. 
There is such a thing as compassion fatigue. And all of us need to be able to take a break from being a fully engaged, connected human. That's why people who've adopted the discipline of meditation say it's crucially important for them every day to spend however long they spend in meditation. It's why many of us like to set aside time just for quiet reading. It's why many of us engage in creative pursuits, whether it's painting or writing or photography or singing or dancing or whatever it might be. This is time. It, it, some people will criticize that and say that's just being selfish. That's just time for you. Well, it certainly is time for me, but it's not selfish because that, that time that I spend singing or painting or meditating or reading or walking or, or somehow uh, either in company with other people, if it's creative activity perhaps, uh, or in solitude, is actually time for recharging the batteries, for replenishing my resources for the undeniably demanding job of being a, a fully, fully realised, compassionate, loving human. It's, it's, not, it's not easy, uh, but it becomes easier when we make sure in every day we have time for nurturing our own spirit. Mm. Mm, it's so important, you know. Again, to since we since we both like using metaphors, it's um, you know, it's so important that the the tree has the opportunity p- to put the roots down into the earth in order to yes. to then be able to grow and ex- and expand and support the ecosystem. Um, and I almost think, you know, meditation or creativity or reading or taking that time out is is our time to kind of ground out and balance in our own energy so that we then can go out and support the ecosystem. Yep, yep, that's a lovely metaphor, I agree. Now, now Hugh, across the course of the book, you have done a deep dive into the 20 places we hide from ourselves. Now, as much as I would love to, we don't have time to go into all (laughs) of these today, so make sure you buy the book. Uh, However, I wanted to, I guess, handpick a few to explore. So... Let's kick off with addiction because I think this is a really big one and, you know, often we think about it as, um, you know, the the more extreme side of addiction as in, you know, it being um, associated with drinking or drugs or, or things like that. But there are a lot of less obvious examples of addiction, which might include, you know, being on our mobile phones all day or, or shopping too much. So how do we define addiction and, and how does it disconnect us from our inner self? Mm. Yes, addiction, I think that probably the best definition of addiction is when a habit becomes so important to us that we, that we, that we think that feeding that habit is our top priority. I mean, that's how people addicted to gambling talk. You know, it it gets to the stage where the most important thing every day is to have an opportunity to play the pokies or whatever other form of gambling they might be involved in. Um, So addiction is a form of surrender where we we give it our top priority. uh, and 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 the way we suffer, of course, is that it then becomes a major distraction from our inner life and our inner self. You mentioned a couple of interesting ones. Smartphone addiction is a very common problem at the moment, where uh, particularly with heavy users of social media, and that tends to be people in the young adult category, late adolescence, early adulthood, but others as well, uh, um, psychologists are now talking about the phenomenon of being connected but lonely, And that's to say that people who are heavily connected, addicted, in fact, to connectivity through social media, then come to experience a deep sense of loneliness because they are not engaged. They're not actually interacting with humans in a face-to-face, person-to-person way, which is what expresses our true inner nature. So any kind of addiction is ultimately a distraction uh, from being connected to our deeper sense of purpose. Mm. 
So the next uh, two hiding places I want to explore, and we've kind of touched on these a little bit already today, but they are ambition and busyness. Mm. And the reason I think it's important to talk about these two is because in the context of of 2020, of COVID-19, I think these hiding places have been somewhat exposed in that our livelihoods, whether they be jobs or businesses, have been threatened. Now, you know, obviously there's there's survival, basic survival being threatened in that, of course, it's stressful if we don't have money. But I, I think another aspect of this is that people have all of a sudden had to stop and turn inwards to face the inner self. Um, now, I know you already touched on this a little little bit today, but can you talk to me about the role ambition and busyness plays in actually disconnecting us from who we are? Mm. Ambition is a, is a, like all of these hiding places, most of the, of the, the hiding places on this list of 20 uh, uh, can be either good or bad. I mean, there, there are, they're not necessarily hiding places. They're only hiding places if we hide in them. I mean, addiction is always a problem, but ambition is a is a perfect example of how uh, there's good ambition and bad ambition. Uh, there's ambition which serves our deeper inner self and our deeper, more humane sense of purpose. And there's ambition that serves the ego. And that is a distraction from our inner self. So the kind of ambition that serves the ego is where people say, I want to get rich, or I want to be famous, or I want the top job, or I want to be prime minister. Uh, and not, I want to be prime minister so that I will be in a position to make, make reforms to our society that will eradicate poverty or uh, homelessness or minimise the... Uh, uh, the inequality between the sexes or you know, whatever it might be, um, but just I want to be prime minister, full stop. Now, that kind of ambition is a huge distraction. I mean, it's, a, it's an absolute feeding of the ego and a huge distraction from the inner life uh, and the health of our inner self. And in fact, it's a suppression of the inner self because it's all about me and what I want. Uh, now, contrast that with people whose ambition is, for example, I had a school teacher in primary school, an unforgettable teacher. Um, and uh, after she had died, uh, uh, I, I spoke to someone who had been a colleague of hers who said, oh, she lacked ambition. And I thought back and I thought this this was a and I've heard other other teachers, in fact, say, say this quite explicitly, that they had been off. She'd been offered promotion, you know, be a deputy principal, be a principal, et cetera, et cetera. No, she didn't want to do that. Her ambition was for the students in her classroom. She, she wanted to be a classroom teacher to nurture kids and to help them flourish. And that's an example of ambition which is an expression of our deep inner purpose. Uh, and that can be the same whether it's the ambition to run a factory so that we can introduce reforms that will make it a more pleasant, uh, productive place to work to the benefit of all concerned, or ambition to be prime minister so we can do something about uh, a, a problems that exist in our society that can be addressed through different social policies or economic policies and so on. So I think when we when we feel ourselves being driven by a powerful ambition, it's worth pausing and reflecting on whether we are being driven by the ego, by the external shell, by the by our sense of personal identity, the desire to be top, or whether we are being driven by uh, a deeper, uh, a more humane uh, sense of purpose, which is how will how can I make the world a better place? Mm. And you know, Hugh, in listening to you talk, I think you're really tapping into something else that's in really important to think about when we look at the inner self versus the external self. If our ambition is coming from a place of power over, i.e., I need to be wealthy. I need to be famous. I need to have power versus the empowerment that comes from the purpose or the ambition that comes from the inner self. 
it, it's such a different energy in terms of what fuels our life and, and what gives us energy and life force. Um, you know, I think you've really captured the difference there between power versus empowerment. And I think mm. it's such an important thing to think about in terms of where we get our personal energy from. Mm. Yes, I agree entirely. I think you've, you've, put, that, you've put that beautifully and I, I support it absolutely. Mm. So let's have a quick chat about certainty. Because this, again, is another hiding place that that has been cracked open this year. And also, from a personal perspective, in exploring the idea of purpose, I liked this one because I think we like to think that purpose gives us certainty, where I don't necessarily think that's true. I think it gives us an internal compass and maybe an inner knowing on the journey. But like anything in life, the destination is never certain. And In the book, you said this, most of us crave certainty so badly that we choose to live as if some things are certain so that we can sink into the warm bath of complacency and cross this or that item off the list of things to worry about. Why is it that we hide in the illusion of certainty and what terrifies us about accepting the unknown or the unknown unknowns as a part of our reality? Mm. Yeah, I think I think we're all um, we're all capable of hiding in this uh, in this shadow of complacency and certainty, of feeling that we're that our view of the world is is not only correct but the only correct one, uh, and that's the real that's a sort of arrogant extension of certainty. I'm right and you're wrong. Um, uh, it, it's it's a seductive hiding place because it is it is a difficult point to reach in our lives, although most of us in the process of maturing do eventually reach it, where we acknowledge that what what it means to be human is that we must live with uncertainty, unpredictability, complexity, ambiguity. This is what life is actually like. Uh, and 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 although we do live operationally as if some things are certain, we, we think the sun will come up tomorrow and we think that, you know the train will arrive roughly on time to take me to work and the office will be there when I get there. Um, those sort of things uh, don't, don't perplex us much. But as you say, when we're talking about our sense of purpose, purpose is like a compass that gives us a sense of direction, but the idea that it will have a fixed trajectory for us, that it will lead to a certain destination, uh, flies in the face of all the evidence of what what human history tells us about the human experience. We are living always, not just through a pandemic, but we are always living in an uncertain world. No relationship is certain. No life is certain. People meet with horrible accidents and suddenly contract life-threatening illnesses. I mean, we, we hang onto this existence by a thread. Uh, and it's quite helpful to acknowledge that, to acknowledge that, that nothing is certain, nothing is absolutely predictable, which doesn't mean, oh, well, in that case, just give up. It means, yes, I still have a clear sense of purpose. I'm heading towards uh, this particular goal, but I know... The goal might change or I mightn't get there, but that sense of purpose uh, is still very important as a, as a motivation for, for keeping going. Um, it, it, it becomes a hazard. It becomes a hiding place when we think we've sort of cracked the code, that we know everything there is to be known. Uh, we've got a, a set of convictions which are unshakable, and that means... We're unreachable to other people. It means we will be very poor listeners, for example, because we won't actually be interested in opinions that are different from ours, even though they might bring some fresh enlightenment if we did, if we did attend to them. So, Hugh, as I mentioned before, there are 20 hiding places, and I've only, you know, listed one or two here. As, as you're the author of the book and through your own experience, which hiding place did you personally find the most influential or, or interesting to explore? The one that intrigues me most um, is one that we've known about throughout human history. A lot of, lot of, there's a lot of ancient wisdom on this subject, 
Uh, it's a central theme in Christianity, uh, in contemporary psychology, and that's the hiding place um, that I've called projection. Uh, and we're all we're all capable of this. We're, we almost all do it. Uh, I'm not going to accuse you of doing it, Rebecca, but I'll bet when you Sorry, think about it. <laughs> uh, and projection is where instead of facing some frailty or some shadow uh, or some sense of inadequacy in ourselves, we criticise other people for that very thing. And in fact, a good test of whether we're projecting is when somebody makes us really cranky or we really feel critical towards uh, someone else, just pause and ask yourself, Do I, am I so steamed up about this because this is actually a problem for me? Uh, and it often is. In fact, the things that get us really riled up in other people are often a really good indicator to us of work that needs to be done on ourselves. But we, we go on blithely with this with this projection. And of course, it works in the short term. If we can deflect uh, the spotlight from a, a, a problem within ourselves and turn it on to what, what we see as a problem in someone else, then for the time being, at least we've let ourselves off the hook. But of course, the problem doesn't go away and eventually we're going to have to face it. But projection is a particularly comfortable hiding place because it allows us to criticise people for all sorts of things that are actually problems for ourselves. What a, what a comfortable hiding place that is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think it's a, a very common hiding place and, and one that probably plays out um, a lot with our, with our family and our intimate circles. Um, we, we probably see that one playing out daily in one way or yes. another. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm afraid that's true. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, obviously The Inner Self is a book that, that has a core focus on, on self-awareness and, and personal development. However, as a psychologist and as someone who has spent, as you've said, more than 80 Earth years uh, under, uh, under your belt and as the author of this book, I would imagine that you have a fairly solid connection with your inner self and that you are someone who has, has obviously used the course of your life to continue to grow, evolve and expand in who you are as a human being. So with that in mind, how do you go about interacting with other people? And, and this is probably a good segue from the idea of, of projection. Uh, do you go, go through a process where you try and help people to connect with their inner self? How do you go about influencing others? Um, I don't explicitly try to encourage people to get more <laughs> closely in touch with their inner self. I think that people would be quite offended by that. Mm. So I, I do it. Uh, more gently via the things I write and speak about and, for example, this conversation, which I hope some people will find helpful. Um, I, I think, I mean, there's, just to take a step back, there's a, there's a famous uh, graph of uh, people's sense of life satisfaction and well-being based on global research on this, on this subject, and it's a U-shaped graph. And what it shows is that during the first half of our lives, through adolescence, early adulthood, through really to our 40s, most of us experience a decline in life satisfaction. And then as we move into our 50s, 60s, 70s, in my case, 80s now, uh, our, our sense of life satisfaction increases. Now, why is that? Uh, there are many reasons, but I think a core reason is that typically when we move through our middle years, often experiencing that, that infamous midlife crisis, we do start to come to terms with who we are in a deeper sense. And as, that, as we warm to that idea of the inner self, the deeper inner sense of purpose, what it actually means to be human, as opposed to just what it means to be Hugh or Rebecca, uh, our sense of satisfaction increases. So as, as we move through uh, a period of life 
Well, and it can happen earlier than that. It doesn't have to be midlife. People who could be listening to this who are 25 may be experiencing the famous quarter life crisis. <laughs> um, but whenever it happens, I think from then on, it's not that we're going to go about encouraging people to explore their inner self, but we are going to be far more patient, far more tolerant, far more accepting of other people and far more prepared to let them find their own way with as much support as they ask of us, of course, and as much encouragement as we can give them. But it is up to the individual, and I think it's up to the rest of us just to show a good example and to offer support and encouragement as we can, rather than being too explicit about this in our, in our personal no one takes kindly to being told face to face, look, you need to get in touch with your inner self, mate. <laughs> yeah, not confronting at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hugh, I've come to the last uh, the last segment of the podcast, uh, and it's a, a little segment I've called Shots of Purpose to, to close us off today. Uh, and basically this segment is a little fireside chat where I ask you some quick questions designed to explore purpose in the present moment. So you can answer with one word or, or just a few sentences. Right. So can you name one emotion that feels like purpose? Uh, love. What recently moved you so much that you shed a tear? Uh I didn't shed a tear, uh, literally, although I did metaphorically shed a tear. What moved me most is the outpouring of compassion that has been evident in people's ability, people's willingness to abide by the restrictions on our behaviour during the pandemic. I see the empty streets, the empty shops, uh, the empty car parks, the empty school playgrounds when our schools were closed, etc. I see those as uh, a, a, an extraordinary outpouring of love and compassion, an acknowledgement that we take each other seriously, that we are prepared to make sacrifices for the common good. Can you name a book or a podcast that rewired your thinking and why? Oh, the book that rewired my thinking, no question. It was a long time ago and I'm still enjoying the fruits of it, uh, is a book called On Becoming a Person. And it's a collection of the writings of Carl Rogers, the American uh, uh, psychotherapist. He wrote it in the late 1960s. It's still in print. And I recommend anyone who's interested in the themes we're talking about uh, to look at on Becoming a Person by Carl Rogers. Oh, amazing. That's why I asked that question. It's a bit selfish. I get to write a really good book list for myself. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you could see through the eyes of any animal, which one would you pick and why? Uh, I suppose I'd say dog because... Dogs are so omnipresent in human society and they observe us and they must, uh, they must regard us as a very easy species to train because they train <laughs> us so well in how to look after them. I love that. They do. And so my final question for you today, is there anything significant over the course of this podcast that you have left unsaid that you should say? Uh, I, I think I've said it, but I'd like to emphasise that no one pretends that it's easy to live a life that promotes social harmony and expresses compassion but the rewards, not the personal rewards, but the, war, the rewards for our families and our neighbourhoods and our workplaces, our communities are immeasurably great. Hugh Mackay, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Um, where can we buy your book, The Inner Self, The Joy of Discovering Who We Really Are? Well, it should be absolutely everywhere at the moment, Rebecca. It's it's newly out, uh, so all all bookshops all bookshops should have it in stock. 
I have enjoyed every second of this podcast today. Thank you so much for joining me on Decoding Purpose. It's been a great pleasure for me. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. If you have enjoyed the podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review. That would be greatly appreciated. And we'd also love you to join the Purpose Movement at Instagram by following us at Decoding Purpose Podcast. Also, a big shout out to our sponsors at Supernova Sound.